Good evening, everyone. Good evening to all my CCI family over here. I, Dr. Vikas Oswal, National NTP Trainer, Chess Consultant, Mumbai, Chairperson of DRTB Sites, Mumbai, and Governor Maharashtra Chess Council of India, welcome you all for this CCI webinar. It's been over a year today. CCI is conducting these CCI webinars and this unique idea of cross consultation webinar is really an extraordinary idea for which I would really love to thank our founder president, uh, Dr. N.H. Krishna and to support him, our founder general secretary, Dr. Narayana Pradipa. I would also like to thank our present CCI president, Dr. Uh, Narendra uh, Metiku and national secretary, Dr. Ravi Doshi would also like to extend my thanks to Dr. Uh, Vijay Kumar Chinam Chitti, who is our CCI coordinator. Today, the hot topic is optic neuropathy, rather drug induced optic neuropathy. And to make this topic more easy and to get some more clarity on this topic, today we have an eminent guest speaker along with us, that is Dr. Sunil Ganekal. To introduce him, Dr. Sunil Ganekal is a eminent ophthalmologist from Davangiri, Karnataka and a good friend of our president, Dr. N.H. Krishna. He has done his MBBS from JJM Medical College, Davangiri, MS Ophthalmology from Regional Institute of Ophthalmology, Bangalore, DNB in 2003 and Fellowship FRCS from Glasgow University, UK. He has done a Ratan Tata Feko Fellowship from Shankaranetralaya, Chennai. Fellowship in Ocular Immunology and UVITs from New York, Eye and Ear, Infirmary, uh, USA. He has published more than 25 articles in peer-reviewed PubMed Index International Journals, has presented papers and conducted instruction courses in various national and international conferences, written many textbook chapters. He is a review reviewer for many prestigious journals like American Journal of Ophthalmology and a Journal of American Association of Pediatric Ophthalmology and a Journal of Ophthalmology. He has a special interest in vitro retina, ocular immunology and ocular oncology. He was a present chairperson scientific committee chairman Karnataka Ophthalmic Society and an AP of JJM Medical College Davangiri. So here I hand over the topic to discuss this further optic neuropathy to Dr. Sunil Ganekar. Hello everyone, today I will be speaking to you regarding ethombital optic neuropathy. As we know, ethombital has been an established first line, uh, frontline drug for the treatment of tuberculosis despite exhibiting uh, toxicity. Ethambrotal is a bacteriostatic drug with a long half-life. Uh, Ethambrotal has got a lot of side effects, uh, general side effects like gastrointestinal upset, nausea, dizziness, fever, pruritus, rash, thrombocytopenia, hepatitis, and peripheral neuropathy. But our main area of concern regarding this talk is regarding the optic neuropathy. The optic neuropathy which results from ethambrotal is basically retrobulbar optic neuropathy, which is uh, most often unpredictable and dependent on treatment cessation and uh, has got a variable resolution post treatment. The routine do daily dose of ethambutal in a tuberculosis patient uh, varies. Those who have not previously received this medication tends to be given in the dosage of 15 mg per kg body weight uh, as a single dose for adults and children. And those who have already previously received ATT, uh, one tends to give in the dosage of 25 mg per kg body weight, which usually decreases after two months or 60 days to 15 mg per kg per day. Regarding the incidence of visual impairment following the starting of ethambutal, ethambutal associated optic neuropathy reported uh, tends to occur in less than 2% of the patients on tuberculosis treatment. The cumulative incidence of visual impairment is uh, as high as 22.5% uh, per 1000 patients treated with ethambutal and permanent visual impairment is seen in 4.3 uh, per 1000 patients. In whom the average dose is 27.5 uh, milligram per kg uh, per day or less and treatment duration was for two to nine months, the incidence of any visual impairment was 19.2 uh, per 1,000 uh, patients and permanent visual impairment was seen in uh, 2.3 uh, per 1,000 patients. 
Higher prevalence of optic neuropathy around 6% has been seen in patients who are on a long-term therapy as high as uh, mean duration of treatment of around 16.1 months. The majority of these episodes are reversible with resolution of uh, impairment after an average of around three months. The incidence of toxicity reported in Indian studies shows that it could be anywhere range from 0.3 to 0.6 to 3%. What are the risk factors associated with ethambital associated optic neuropathy? The commonest risk factors of one is the old age, impaired renal, uh, creatinine clearance or a renal insufficiency, the high dose of uh, treatment uh, more than 27.5 milligram per kg per day, the prolonged duration of ethambital ranging from two to nine months, associated hypertension, concurrent associated optic neuritis which should uh, or associated chronic alcohol intake or a tobacco intake, and a patient who has got an immunodeficiency like HIV patients, those are the high-risk patients who tends to develop ethambital associated optic neuropathy. The patient with uh, these risk factors uh, should be given prescribed, the drug should be prescribed with caution, and pros and cons of therapy should be explained to the patient. Ethambital toxicity is clearly dose related. Uh, if you look at the, the slide, the higher the dosage from ranging from 60 milligram to 100 milligram per per day, the incidence of uh, optic neuropathy is as high as 50%. And if you reduce the dosage to around 50 milligram per kg per day, the incidence is uh, reduces to around 1%, which is for a duration of around, if you give the treatment for a duration of around two months. But the no, do no safe dose has been determined, but because the toxicity has been noted with the lower dose as low as 12.3 milligram per kg per day in literature. The optic neuropathy, which develops secondary to ethambital, is basically a retrobulbar neuritis, which can occur either due to the involvement of uh, axial or central fibers of the optic nerve or involving the peripheral or the periaxial fibers of the optic nerve. The picture on the right side uh, shows the distribution of the retinal nerve fibers, which ended the optic nerve, has been shown in the right side. When the central type of uh, fibers are involved in the optic nerve, they tend to cause, uh, basically occurs due to the involvement of the papillomacular bundles or the central fibers of the optic nerve. They tend to have a decreased visual equity, the central or a centrocecal scotoma in the central area. The blue yellow color deficiency is noted in these patients. If somebody has got a peripheral type of uh, nerve fibers are involved, you tend to have got a peripheral visual field loss, bitemporal defects, the visual equity can be spared and you tend to have a red-green color deficiency. Here is the picture which shows the, the optic nerve and the healthy fovea in a human retina and the distribution of retinal for nerve fibers are also on the right side. What is the mechanism of optic neuropathy? Ethambital is, a, is basically a metal chelator. Either it chelates the zinc and the copper. Ethambital chelates the zinc, which is a very important factor for the optic nerve function. The zinc uh, chelation also inhibits the lysosomal activation. Zinc deficiency leads to destruction of myelin and glial cell proliferation. The chelation of copper disrupts the oxidative phosphorylation in mitochondria and uh, decreased copper availability for an enzyme cytochrome C oxidase, which is very much essential for the axonal transport in the optic nerve. Ethambital causes decrease in cytosolic calcium and uh, in turn increases the mitochondrial calcium and uh, you tend to see an increase in mem mitochondrial membrane potential. The insufficiency of mitochondria in optic nerve fibers may underlie the impairment of auxonal transport in the optic nerve and thus leads to the optic neuropathy. Ethambital usage may be associated with the deficiency of other vitamins like vitamin E, vitamin B1, which may exacerbate the optic neuropathy. What is the clinical presentation of patients associated with optic neuropathy? The onset of ocular symptoms is usually delayed, may occur, uh, uh, generally occurs usually after two months, uh, or uh, toxicity may not be seen until two months of uh, treatment, starting of the treatment. However, in rare cases, due to idiosyncratic reaction, one tend to see these toxicity effects within the couple of days of start with, uh, uh, standard dose of uh, ethambutol. Signs and symptoms can be subclinical in the early stage, so it is difficult to pick up in the early stage unless you examine the patients. The presenting ocular symptoms may vary from among the affected individuals. The patient who are affected and symptomatic, they tend to present with bilateral progressive painless blurring of vision associated with color vision abnormality. Some patients may be asymptomatic. The results of clinical examination are likely to vary from patient to patient. Both eyes are usually equally affected, but sometimes there could be an asymmetry between the two eyes. The loss of visual equity usually starts at the central point, seeing a blurring of uh, at the point of fixation, what we call it as a relative scotoma, which tends to progress to bilateral painless declining vision. The visual equity reduction in these patients in range anywhere from a normal vision to almost no light perception. A you know, patient may not see any light. The worse the vision at presentation, worse will be the final vision. So one should clearly look into the what is the vision at presentation in these patients. Eye examination by slit lamps typically shows on the right side of the picture, you can see the, the greenish dots, which are nothing but the corneal erosions, which tends to occur in some of these patients. 
and pigmentary changes on the conjunctiva as shown in the right uh, corner photograph you can see the pigmentary changes in the conjunctiva can be seen in causing melanosis or brown iridis also can be seen due to optic nerve or neuropathy the pupils are usually sluggish in these patients but you may not see the relative afferent pupillary defect in these patients because there will be bilateral symmetrical involvement of the optic nerves on retinal examination or a fundus examination initial uh, some of the patients due to retrobulbar involvement the optic nerve examination or the fundus examination could be absolutely normal but in some acute cases you tend to see an edema disc edema hemorrhage around the disc hyperemia can be seen in these patients if you look at the chronic stages of ethambutal toxicity this edema and other things progresses to either partial or total optic atrophy resulting in paler of the disc which could be a complete paler or just a temporal paler of the optic disc the most critical aspect of treatment of ethambutal toxicity is detecting the toxicity in the subclinical stage of uh, uh, subclinical stage so some of the tests which may be very helpful in uh, detecting the at the earlier stage or the subclinical stage is the use of uh, tests known as electrophysiological tests basically we do tend to do two sorts of such tests one is called as a electro retinography other is a visual evoke potential these tests are very useful in the detecting the subclinical optic neuropathy on the right side of the picture we tend to see an uh, visual evoke potential this is a visual evoke potential is a basically a sort of an electroencephalography which is recorded from the occipital lobes if you look at the visual uh, uh, the vep or the visual evoke potentials there will be significantly reduced the, the amplitude of the wave forms in a patient who has got ethambutal optic neuropathy and these tests are useful in differentiating it from the demyelinating diseases which also tend to cause a decrease in amplitude in this visual evoke potential pattern erg or electro retinography is very useful in identifying the macular lesions and thus helps to differentiating from the other retinal pathologies the another important test which has been shown on the right bottom corner picture shows that it's a multifocal electro retinography which is useful in excluding from other retinal causes which causes the decrease in vision is an another patient to a patient with an ethambutal toxicity who underwent a multifocal electro retinography which shows a decrease in amplitude and the increase in latency in these patients so thus you can detect the toxicity in the is a patient with ethambutal toxicity uh, with a pattern reversal visual evoke potential which shows that the p and red peak latencies are reduced the another uh, recent advances in investigation and uh, which is a non invasive and very useful and patient friendly is the optical coherence tomography which is a uh, nothing but an like a ct scan of the retina which uh, scans the retina in the layers there are 10 layers of the retina which are scanned layer by layer uh, the resolution of this scanning is around in the microns measured in microns 3 to 4 microns so even the finest of the final uh, details can be picked up of the retinal details can be picked up by this investigation so this oct uh, uh, very useful in detecting the the two important layers of the retina which are affected in the ethambutal toxicity one is the retinal nerve fiber layer other is a ganglion cell layer as you can see on the left side uh, the oct or optical coherence tomography print out which is showing the affected uh, retinal nerve fiber on the right side you can clearly see the ganglion cell involvement which are the important layer of the retina which is getting affected by the ethambutal toxicity so what are the changes one tend to see in this retinal nerve fiber and ganglion cell layer in the acute toxicity the retinal nerve fiber shows an initial increase in thickening the ganglion cell thickness is significantly reduced the retinal ganglion cells have got an abundant micro mitochondria and they are more concentrated in the important uh, peripheral areas so in eye density those are will be typically affected in ethambutal optic uh, neuropathy thus leads to the thinning of the retinal ganglion cell bodies in the macula and axonal swelling in the around the optic disc which are considered to be the early signs of ethambutal induced optic neuropathy so the thinning of the retinal nerve fiber or the ganglion cell layer typically correlates with the affecting of the papillomacular bundle for example the inferotemporal quadrant will be typically affected of retinal nerve fiber which in turn corresponds to the papillomacular bundle involvement retinal ganglion cells inferonasal involvement typically correlates with the involvement of the papillomacular bundle the another non invasive tool which helps in detecting the early ethambutal toxicity is oct angiography or optical coherence tomography angiography this is an non invasive dialless angiography which we tend to do in the eye to pick up the circulation patterns in the retina basically if you look at the central circle the vessel density if you calculate by this investigation which tends to drop in patients with ethambutal toxicity thus you can pick up these uh, patients of uh, early or subclinical stage the toxicity can be picked up and can you can stop the discontinue the medications the another visual function which can be affected in ethambutal toxicity is a contrast sensitivity 
and the contrast density should be typically assessed with a chart which has been shown in the picture using a chart known as pelly robson chart and you can quantify the contrast sensitivity reduction depending upon the dosage and duration of ethambutal toxicity the visual field defects is another uh, visual function which will be affected in ethambutal toxicity the insulin incidence of visual defects vary among uh, different studies in general visual field defects tends to appear with the use of higher dose of uh, ethambutal drug the central scotoma or the central cecal scotoma is the most common visual defect and seen but sometimes you can see other field defects like peripheral field defects bitemporal defects and many sorts of field defects can be seen on the picture on the right uh, lower cor right corner the bottom corner you can see the central and central cecal scotoma which is shown in the pictorial form the color vision is another important thing and which is the uh, also known as dyschromatopsia may be one of the first detectable signs of ocular toxicity and they tend to appear even before the visual acuity or visual field changes are seen there could be two sorts of uh, color vision uh, deficiencies which can be noted one is the blue yellow which is uh, commonly seen in the earlier stages of toxicity and the red green color deficiency which tends to develop in the later forms of toxicity there are many tests which are available for the assessment of color vision on the right top corner what we known as the ishiara color plates which are commonly used color vision tests for screening of the color vision or color blind patients but the, the one of the disadvantages of this ishiara charts is they uh, detect only uh, red green color deficiency so that they tend to miss some of the blue yellow deficiency so you cannot use for 100% say that, that the patient has got a color deficiency using the screening tools so the blue yellow defects can be very well picked up on the test we using a test known as transfer the d15 100 d15 u test as shown in the right lower uh, picture this is a very useful test which detects the all sorts of color deficiencies the literature says that uh, ethambutal optic neuropathy usually associated with visual acuity loss of in around 9.4% of the patient visual field defects in 6.3% optic disc abnormalities in 4.7% and color vision abnormalities around 12.3% of the patient is this toxicity reversible yes it is considered to be reversible on discontinuation of the uh, treatment but uh, some of the studies shows that permanent visual improvement has been reported in literature in some of the patients who are on a long term therapy and long term follow so one need to be very cautious even though you stop the drug the reversibility or the uh, recovery may be poor in some of the patients inh is another drug which is frequently uh, prescribed along with ethambutal in tuberculosis isonate uh, inh therapy is also been associated with optic neuropathy but sometimes it becomes difficult to differentiate between the two of toxicity relating from inh or due to ethambutal however though the toxicity resulting from inh is less frequent less severe and usually always reversible the inh should be discontinued in patient if the vision loss continues beyond 6 weeks of discontinuation of the ethambutal when you look at a patient with optic neuropathy of associated with ethambutal you need to differentiate it from other forms of uh, optic neuropathy especially those who got a rapid in onset of optic neuropathy causes like demyelinating disorders inflammatory disorders ischemic changes or trauma these are some of the causes which causes the rapid onset of optic neuropathy sometimes a slow onset of optic neuropathy you need to rule out compressive lesions of the optic nerve or the optic chiasma the other toxic conditions nutritional conditions and the hereditary causes which causes the optic neuropathy So how do you manage this ethambutal associated optic neuropathy is once ethambutal induced ocular toxicity is recognized the drug should be immediately stopped and patient should be referred to an ophthalmologist for further evaluation presently therapy discontinuation is the only effective management strategy clinicians should consider optical coherence tomography contrast sensitivity testing to detect subclinical optic neuropathy not detected with baseline examinations as i told before the optic neuropathy could be due to the other causes also so ethambutal induced optic neuropathy is basically a diagnosis of exclusion so you should do additional lab and imaging tests also has to be done like complete blood cell count urine analysis for av metal screening serum b12 assessment red blood cell folate levels to rule out routine nutritional deficiencies liver function tests assessing the enzymes and other things mean corpuscular volume tests for alcoholism so the many tests which helps to differentiate it from the other causes of optic neuropathy the even the mri of the optic nerve and optic chiasma should be done to rule out the compressive lesions mri orbital view with fat suppression should be done to exclude the demyelinating lesions so what are the recommendations for somebody who is on treatment with ethambutal what are the things to be done from the physician's point of view please order a baseline examination which should include visual acuity testing anterior segment examination pupillary evaluation color vision testing contrast testing fundus or retinal evaluation including the optic nerve examination optical coherence tomography testing and visual field testing all high risk patients the baseline examination should be done at every month 
Asymptomatic patient should be monitored every one to three months. Non-Irish patient should undergo examination at three and six months. Health education to the patients regarding the visual side effects and visual symptoms should be clearly explained and they should see an ophthalmologist if any of these symptoms develop. However, assessing visual acuity can be challenging in certain population, including those who have baseline visual deficits, dementia, or home bound. The treatment includes basically for discontinuation of the ethambutal drug. Checkup should be done monthly for patient taking more than 15 milligram per kg per day. day. The prognosis basically depends on the dosage and duration of ethambutal. The another important thing is one can use the, uh, the digital commercially available uh, apps like Niksha app. So you can record the pre-existing visual impairment and renal function impairment in the patient details in these apps. Any visual disturbances should be recorded and, uh, under adverse reactions uh, section in a patient's follow-up data. So it's a very useful app in uh, following and uh, monitoring the patients. Consider app-based testing of visual screening at community level or at a physician's level. The most important thing is notification of confirmed case of ethometal toxicity either to the RMTCP or with the pharmacovigilance program of India. At a community level, you can help the patient by creating an awareness among community healthcare providers like ASHA workers. At follow-up visits at home or at center, give them a questionnaire with the following questions. They should ask, is there any loss of vision or a blurred vision? Do the color vision appear faded? The field must worker must uh, refer the patient to a treating physician if the patient complains of any of these visual dysfunction. So in conclusion, tuberculosis is a public health problem and it would be difficult to eradicate the disease and the use of ethambutal is most likely to continue. All newly diagnosed tuberculosis patients should have an ophthalmological evaluation before commencing treatment with ethambutal. The doctor prescribing ethambutal should be aware of its ocular toxicity and all patients should be educated of its potential side effects. Early detection is the key to the reversing toxicity and recovering vision. A multidisciplinary team approach involving the patient, prescribing doctor, and an ophthalmologist should work together to make an ethambutal a safe drug. When side effects are noticed, the ethambutal should be discontinued immediately. The total duration of treatment is more important for final visual prognosis than is the duration of time to cessation. When ocular toxicity is severe, both ethambutal and INH should be immediately stopped. However, it is cru crucial to consult the prescribing doctor and other managing doctors before discontinuing any medication to prevent harm to patients' overall health. With this, I would like to conclude my thank, uh, talk. I would like to thank the Chess Council of India for giving me this opportunity. I would be, be more than happy to take any questions regarding to this topic. Thank you, one and all. Thanks for patient hearing. Okay, so this was a fantastic session, a fantastic presentation, which was been made by Dr. Sunil Ganekal. Uh, he has covered almost everything, you know, whatever probably I had tried to just note it down, pen down over here to, uh, to be asked. He has already covered everything in the presentation. Still, there are around 35 questions lying down over here in the chat box. So we will just try and cover over here as much as possible. As such, we have ample of time over here. Dr. Sunil, sir. Yeah, sure. Am I audible? Yeah. Yeah, you are absolutely audible. Very clear. Sure. So first we'll start with the color blindness, sir. Suppose if the patient is having a congenital color blind, color blindness, and if the patient is been diagnosed as tuberculosis and started an AKT, for this patient, how would we differentiate that this color blindness basically was his uh, baseline or was, was it because of AKT toxicity? Uh, that's why we uh, give too much of relevance to the doing a routine screening test before starting any patient on ethambutal, whether it's irrespective of whether it has got a color deficiency or not, the best would be to differentiate at the initially before you start the treatment itself, rather than thinking about differentiating later. Once you start the treatment, whether it was the hereditary is the cause or the drug induced color deficiency, better would be to screen the patient at the initial stage itself than thinking about on the later stage. Exactly. So that, that, that's what the point was over here to be made that we chest physicians somehow miss on a baseline screening test through, by an ophthalmologist. So probably if we just happen to make a routine screening, at least at the baseline, it would really help our patient. And we would be able to differentiate between a lot many things and compare it through the baseline and if any drug toxicity, if there is, right? Yeah. Uh, so by mistake, the mic is gone on mute. 
Vikas sir, the mic is on me. Okay. So the next question over here, sir. Usually we get an answer from ophthalmologist. Usually many of the ophthalmologists they tell that red green color blindness is already there. So does it mean that this red green color blindness is already like uh, the just the initial stage? Or we have crossed certain grading for uh, the uh, toxicity of the drug, or or what could be the stage where we could think of decreasing the dose or stopping the drug? Uh, basically, we need to quantify the color vision defect because the thing is, we are the we, there are as I told there are various uh, color screening methods which are available. When you look at the color deficiency, there could be there are some primary colors and secondary colors. the red green is the one which commonly gets affected but as you progress the blue yellow can also tends gets affected so we if you look at the just a screening color vision test you may miss many of the color vision defects and you may not pick up also like i showed there is a basic screening test tool called ishiras plates which is commonly used by most of the ophthalmologists they tend to miss many of the color vision deficiencies so ideally would be do a standardized color vision test which not only specifically tells which sort of color deficiency whether it has got a blue yellow Red, red, green, and you can quantify also how much is the color deficiency at each visit. So it will be easy to quantify and tell the patient. So ideal screening test has to be chosen before you tell the patient what sort of deficiency has got. So suppose, sir, if the patient is having a baseline blue-yellow color defect, which okay. is uh, which is supposed to be the most initial stage or uh, initial phase of defect. That yeah. means the patient is already in an initial phase of developing okay. toxicity. Okay. So do I take this point over here that if the patient is having blue yellow color defect, to I should not proceed ahead with ethambutol for that particular patient? Yeah. When I do think about a drug toxicity, I won't consider the color vision criteria alone to stop the medications. Probably I would look at his visual acuity. No, no, sir. Sorry, sir. Uh, over here, I am I am asking about starting the treatment. Suppose okay. if I have started the treatment, but on baseline I am already having a blue yellow color defect for the patient. Okay. So now, do I start it, uh, add ethambutol to my regimen, or do don't I? It depends upon the quantification I told. If it is a mild deficiency, definitely you can go ahead. If it is a moderate or severe the sort of thing, probably may have to uh, think of other drugs rather than starting on a ethambutol toxicity, the ethambutol drug. So that means these patients just require close monitoring and a regular follow up. Yeah, and, true. And we keep on quanti uh, quantifying quantifying the defect yeah. of the color visions. Okay. Color visions. That's great. Uh, next question, sir. I was last uh, ask about the steroids, sir. I would really like to know the role of steroids in ocular toxicities. That when do we start steroids? Is there any role of topical steroids, or do we need to think of oral steroids? And is there any role of parenteral steroids? If yes, th when? Thing is, uh, there is no role for topical steroids are ruled out. Uh, it won't help in anything. but optic neuropathy once you see a case of optic neuropathy you should be clear cut with your uh, etiological diagnosis whether it is secondary to trauma whether it is due to infection inflammation or demyelinating disorders or ischemic changes or it is nutritional related so is there are certain uh, diseases or optic neuropathy which clear cut responds to the parenteral and oral steroids for example somebody has got a demyelinating disorder definitely will respond to steroid suppose a compressive lesion may not respond to the steroid inflammatory optic neuropathies definitely they respond to steroids so there is a trial which has been done which is clearly especially in demyelinating disorders which is known as optic neuritis treatment trial also known as ontt trial which gives a clear cut guidelines of when to start steroids and when to stop it they say that in acute phase better to start with an parenteral or an intravenous preferably dexamethasone may not work we may have to switch over to a higher dose steroids like methylprednisolone we tend to give it in the dose of 1 1 gram per day then for first three four days then we shift over to the oral steroids so is it the same as pulse talking about 1 gram yeah, yeah. methylprednisolone for three days and then uh, oral steroids yeah, yeah oral steroids for a prolonged period otherwise if you just switch start on with the ontt trial what it says is if you instead of parenteral if you just start an oral steroid there is a high rate of recurrence of optic neuritis without considering a parenteral thing okay so that means only oral steroids for ocular toxicity will be sufficient is that what you uh, are making a point over here a uh, parenteral in the initial acute stages definitely has to be considered then should be switched over to oral steroids so is there we would think of parenteral and 
or only oral only uh, oral i would not only oral i won't recommend probably parenteral and then followed by oral steroids as a maintenance thing unless there is a contraindications for parenteral steroids sorry there was a disconnection over here yeah okay so only oral you won't recommend so you mean to say go ahead with 3 days of pulse therapy 1 gram methylprednisolone followed by oral steroids oral steroids Is that right and, yeah. and if this oral steroid would you like to give it for around 4 weeks period or just 11 days or 15 days it depends upon the basically on the etiology i told probably for a demyelinating disorder you may have to give it for a little bit longer period for a trauma we can uh, two to three weeks should be sufficient so it depends upon the etiology of the optic neuritis based on that we can adjust the dosage and the duration of steroids and one thing is very obvious when you are thinking of starting steroids for optic neuritis we are definitely uh, stopping the offending drug like ethambidol yeah. right true, true. that is the, that is the first but, yeah but uh, suppose if there is an ocular toxicity which is uh, increasing for more than 6 weeks we would also think of stopping isoniazide along with ethambidol am i right true, true. yeah yeah correct okay so this would be in case of sensitive tb uh, let me just uh, deviate a bit from uh, sensitive to resistant tb over here since we are on linezolid over here all all our regimen we have linezolid for good 18 months period so sir do you recommend the same steroid regimen even for drtb patients or would it be there there is some difference between the uh, maintain, uh, management over here there, there is a difference in management basically we need to look at the the drug toxicity how severe it is and what is the other associated risk factors associated with this how long to be given is what is, suppose sometimes if uh, removing the risk factors itself may reduce the toxicity itself somebody who has got a, a renal parameters are altered you may have to adjust the renal parameters so, so there are many associated so patient has to be treated taken care as a whole rather than thinking about the steroid perspective alone okay sir uh, sir any role of b complex over here along with steroids yeah that's what i told you. when you do a blood test better to do a co associated vitamin deficiency also has to be ruled out for example especially vitamin b12 and vitamin e if there is a deficiency they tend to affect the axonal transport in the optic now so one need to evaluate these things associated things also those also should be given as a supportive treatment along with steroids if there is a deficiency of any of those those things are there okay sir uh, sir you had mentioned about vep prg that yeah. is uh, some of the diagnostics required for the optic neuritis yeah, but yeah. Uh, many of the uh, uh, districts or many of the villages or many even cities they don't have these facilities available over there so is it really that important for referring all our patients for vep or perg or is there any yeah, some, the, thi uh, the the thing is uh, these tests are useful only in the subclinical stage to pick up the infection see for example general ophthalmologists usually did a visual field test visual acuity assessment color vision these are all develops in the clinical stage of toxicity suppose before the sorry sir your mic is gone on mute i'm sorry am yeah. i audible yeah. yes yes you are these are the tests which are basically useful in the subclinical stage these are not mandatory tests but definitely they are worth doing it if you want to before these Uh, uh clinical symptom starts before that if you want to pick up definitely these tests are very useful on one thing the second thing is these tests are helpful in differentiating from many retinal pathologies which being supposed to similar visual field defects and color vision deficiencies so one may get confused whether it is due to retinal problem or due to the optic nerve problem in those scenarios probably these tests are very useful sir the next question is coming over here like uh, there is a dose difference in case of children and in adults of ethambutol children require a higher dosage of ethambutol versus a uh, dosage of ethambutol which is lesser in case of adult so is there any uh, uh, you know because since the dosage is higher will the toxicity will be higher or is the is the incidence seen higher in case of children compared to adults is there something like that no children their literature also says that children probably may tend to tolerate the toxicity much better than the adults because age itself is a risk factor for the ethambutol toxicity hello yes got it sir yeah the children probably may tolerate the toxicity are much better than when compared to the age uh, older patients or an age related patient because age itself is a 
significant risk factor as the age progresses definitely there will be toxicity will be more but another the the problem with the children assessment of is the subjective evaluation is very very difficult in this children we basically we may have to rely on more on objective tests to pick up the effects of toxicity like visual acuity assessment is difficult they may not cooperate for many of the things know, the probably same. only test we may have to do is electrophysiological tests under general anesthesia that, that that's the only thing okay and suppose if that facility is not available over there in that hospital so that yeah the pre, the pre a pre verbal children that is the difficulty thing the visual fields and the other things are very difficult in so children basically that's the challenge and a skill challenge yeah, over there yeah yeah I would like to ask something about MRI over here. Yeah. Uh, role of MRI in cases of optic neuritis. So yeah. does MRI really help in all cases of visual disturbances? Yeah, MRI basically I would be indicated in definitely in three four conditions. I would suggest the one could be if somebody has got an optic neuropathy secondary to trauma. The demyelinating disorders definitely yes. The classical signs of uh, demyelinating changes in the both in the brain as well as a periopticular area can be clearly seen. White matter lesions can be seen. the other thing is a compressive lesions so trauma compressive lesions and demyelinating disorders probably one should consider an mri before uh, thinking as a differential diagnosis and is there some uh, uh, specific uh, pattern what we require to see in mri like mri with optic nerve pathway or uh, along with optic chiasma or something or just yeah. a plain mri brain will do yeah we up to optic chiasma is the area of our interest from the optic nerve whatever the four portions of the intra orbital portion of the optic nerve till it goes up to the optic chiasma one need to look for the changes which occurs in the those things and the of course on the white matter lesions which you tend to see in the brain in the demyelinating disorders uh the next question coming over here is what are the symptoms of um is ocd the only diagnostic choice and if it is not available everywhere in the metro cities then what would you do i suppose uh, one already... thing I, one I thing i will tell you yes. one thing i'll tell you the ocd has become a, such a common tool with all of them all this i practice in a small town called daungere which has got around six ocd machines in daungere so ocd has become a much basic tool for everywhere it is available now unlike uh, electrophysiological test ocd is easily accessible visual fields and ocd contrast sensitivity these are available with all of them all this okay sir there is one interesting question over here uh, how do we differentiate between ocular tb and drug induced toxicity so is there some difference between both yeah ocular tb unlikely to involve the optic now that typically the ocular signs of tb tend to involve the choroid more because it the transmission of the tubercle bacilli to the eye is mainly through the blood circulation the choroidal circulation through pulmonary circulation it reaches the eye and it you tend to see choroidal granulomas choroidal tubercles optic neuritis can occur secondary to tuberculosis but it presents as a more of a the uh, optic neuritis which results from tuberculosis tends to have a typical involvement of a, you can see the fundus changes but unlike ethambital toxicity which you tend to more of a retrobulbar neuritis that means to say you may not see any optic nerve or disc changes when you see the eye examination the toxicity will be only picked up on visual testing so tuberculosis can cause optic neuritis but it's very rare so can i take a liberty to comment over here as uh, op optic neuritis there would be a visual disturbance color blindness the color uh, de defects whereas in cases of ocular tb there won't be any color defect am i right over here sir yeah yeah, yeah. the the clear differentiating point what i understand over here right yeah true 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 and another thing is eye examination itself can give a clue apart from the optic nerve will not there will be other ocular signs secondary to tb right uh, okay what is the role is there any role of vasodilators in cases of ethambital toxicities vasodilators unlikely because the etiology is uh, very, something else it is at the mitochondrial level not unlike ischemic optic neuropathy where uh, blood circulation is hampered here the blood circulation issue is not there probably vasodilators may not have much role in ethambital toxicity right 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 sir uh, sir the same problem right now we are facing with the uh, linezolid uh, linezolid toxicity we are seeing is like worse than ethambital because ethambital causes this uh, it is just it is just incidence is just around 2% as you have already yeah. told and it is 6% in cases of duration longer duration of ethambital which is more than 6 months right but in linezolid yeah. which we are giving right now for around good 24 months 
we are really okay. seeing a lot many uh, peripheral neuropathies along with uh, uh, ocular toxicities in yeah. lesions where okay. we are not left with any other option other than just stopping the drug and replacing Run. it with some other drug that, that's yeah. the only option yeah. sir i would like you to just clarify one more thing over here from your own this thing that when do we need to think of stopping isoniazide along with ethambutol when do we consider that this toxicity is not only along with ethambutol but also isoniazide since it is also one of the important bactericidal drug which is very important for our treatment of regimen for att for our treatment of sensitive tb so when do we think of stopping isoniazide also over here it's a very good question the thing is uh, isoniazide itself can cause ocular toxicity but the incidence may not be as not as high as ethambutol toxicity the first you should think of stopping the ethambutol wait for around 6 to 8 weeks you see that if there is no visual improvement beyond 6 to 8 weeks of stoppage of ethambutol probably i would consider the stopping of inh also okay so stopping of inh over here that means we definitely now need to replace this drug with some other drug some other drug yeah. right Yeah. A last question over here. That is, other than ethambutol, linezolid, crotinamide, rifabutin, isoniazide, uh, streptomycin also causes optic neuritis. If the patient is on combination regimen of drug resistant TB, how do we pick up the culprit drug, or is it to remove only the uh, notorious drug in case of drug induced optic neuritis? Uh, it's a difficult question to answer probably what i would suggest is first is uh, uh, taking out the high risk drugs one by one one by one whichever is there you feel that ethambutol take it out so one by one stopping one by one after the other and closely monitoring the patient over a period of is an issue rather than you cannot stop all the drugs because it is a life, some of them are life saving drugs you cannot stop everything uh, based on that so the one by one one by one it's a exclusion criteria like that one by one you exclude stop see the response then go ahead accordingly but very difficult to reach challenge over here and see for the further increase of toxicities over here because it's a slow progress it's not an acute progress yeah yeah actually not an acute problem right sir one last question over here i would really like to ask this suppose if the patient is having cataract and if patient is complaining of blurring of vision now how do we really you know conclude that this loss of vision is because of not because of uh, ocular toxicity and it is because of cataract because both of the patient will complain would be same sir there is a test called as potential acuitymetry what we call pam pam so if you do a potential acuitymetry test if patient has got a just a cataract he should improve with that test visual acuity should improve with that test okay okay so pam pam am i right so the potential acuitymeter potential means what is the potential of visual gain after cataract surgery got uh, it got so it, got if, it got it if you do that test and if the patient sees an improvement vision with pam test definitely vision loss is due to cataract than due to any other pathology great so that means suppose if there is because of cataract there is no need to worry to stop any of the drugs we can yeah. happily safely continue our continue with the tamitol and yeah. no need to alter or worry about the yeah, yeah worry about the i think sir we have almost covered all the questions over here still i would just like to check one last time if i am left with any of the questions okay a last question of uh, diabetes and optic neuritis suppose a patient is having diabetes and if you are suspecting diabetic he is also having diabetic neuropathy and patient is also on att so how do we differentiate now whether is it diabetic neuropathy or is it whether is it drug induced toxicity uh, diabetes are unlikely to involve the optic now the only condition which is associated with diabetic and optic now what we described as diabetic papillopathy diabetic papillopathy typically develops in the iddm stage rather than niddm patients their visual loss is not gross usually they respond very well to steroids so if you give a low dose of steroids uh, in diabetic patient they tend to involve but unlike retinal involvement optic nerve involvement is very very rare in diabetics so uh, that helps in differentiating us more towards ethambutol thing whenever there is an optic nerve involvement in diabetic patients than thinking about diabetic papillopathy or diabetic pa optic nerve involvement that's it okay i think sir we have covered almost everything still from your side if you wish to just get, give us some take away points last closing points Would yeah there's uh, we have come up with many investigative newer tools and newer imaging things which are coming up which uh, the one good thing about the ophthalmological recent investigations is we can pick up many of the problems in the subclinical stage now 
no need not that patient should present with visual symptoms or he should have an optic nerve clinical symptoms then you pick up the toxicity there is no point in that better to start uh, screen them at the subclinical stage or before you start the treatment with many of the non invasive imaging modalities so it is very useful tools are available we can pick up the early toxicity and that should benefit the patient that's really great Okay, sir. This was really nice talking to you and clarifying all our doubts over here. I think we have covered maximum of doubts of our viewers over here. Still, if you think I have missed on some of the doubts, please let us know so that I will just coordinate along with Dr. Sunil and would just try to solve your questions and queries. Thanks a lot, Dr. Sunil, sir, for your valuable time and this for such an enlightening uh, presentation today. Seriously. This was Thank always you. a hurdle in our mind, you know, that when do we stop uh, ethambitol? Do we really stop ethambitol? Or what, what else can we do? But I, I think today, much of the points have got clarified over here. I really appreciate this. Thank you, sir. Thanks, because for moderating the thing, I would like to thank uh, Chess Council of India for giving me this opportunity to speak in some of the non-ophthalmic webinars. I'm really thrilled to present because we have been participating in most of the ophthalmic webinars. I would like to thank once again Chess Council of India for that opportunity. Thank you. Thanks once again. Even I would like to thank Dr. N. H. Krishna, our founder president of uh, CCI, for coming up with such a great and fantastic, unique idea of creating this cross consultation webinar, which is yeah. not only helping only the chess physicians, but all other faculties in all. Yeah, I congratulate Krishna for that because it's a multidisciplinary or a multi speciality approach is very much required in today's practice. Uh, right. I congratulate once again Dr. Krishna for that. Right. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you once once again. Thanks thank a you. lot for uh, thanks a lot to all our CCI viewers for your for your patient listening over here. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.